welcome to Fruity Knitting. This is the 86th episode. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. And we have some great guests lined up for you in this episode. So hopefully by the end, you'll feel really inspired with your knitting. Our feature interview is with the innovative designer, Olga Baraya Kefalian, who's also known as Olga Jazzy. It's a two-part interview and we cover lots of interesting knitting topics from modular knitting, 3D knitting, yeah. advanced brioche, and also Olga shows us some of her very stylish designs, so you'll enjoy seeing that. Then we have Constance Cadell, who is featuring again in our Knitters of the World segment, and Constance is a really talented and prolific maker. Whatever she does just turns out stunningly, whether it's knitting, crochet or sewing. And she's going to show you her latest knitting project, which is a masterpiece. You will love it. And the other segment is one that both Andrew and I are particularly excited about. We visit an Australian sheep farm. And this sheep farm has introduced permaculture farming techniques to help them combat drought, erosion, and just the Australian harsh climate. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They farm Saxon Merinos, which is a breed that was bred specifically for their very high fleece quality. So they're not meat sheep at all. Um, they have a micron count between 14 and 17, which is extraordinarily low. In recent years, they've decided that instead of sending their entire fleece uh, or all of their fleeces overseas to be processed and turned into suits or underwear or sportswear, they're keeping some of their fleeces and they're producing their very own yarn. So it's a really fantastic story and there's some stunning footage of the Australian outback there too. So it's under construction now with my new project, which is the Morning Star Bridal Jacket by the Danish designer Crystal Seifarth. We interviewed Crystal in our very last episode, and it's actually one of my very favorite interviews that we've done. So if you haven't seen it, you definitely need to go back and watch it. And because I needed to research Crystal's work and her designs to prepare for that interview, she sent me a copy of her latest book called Fee Strick Beyond the Horizon. It's a really beautiful book. There's 11 patterns in it, but it's so much more than just a collection of patterns. It's full of musings and anecdotes about daily life on Fano, both historically and in the present time. And Crystal's family have been living on the island since 1641, so she knows the Fano culture and history really intimately. And during the interview, Crystal talks about the Fainu sailors who were often gone for up to two years at a time and they would sail to the ends of the earth, including Australia. And one of Crystal's ancestors sailed to Australia and didn't come back. So she now has a branch of her family living in Australia. Well, my grandfather is Danish. He was a sailor and he too sailed the high seas and he sailed out to Australia and also didn't go back to Denmark. He settled there and he ended up becoming the harbour master of Port Adelaide. So we feel that we have a branch of our family in Denmark. And when Andrew and I first came to Germany, we spent a summer visiting all of my relatives in Denmark. And we went up to Skagen, which is right at the top of Denmark. And my uh, relatives have a holiday cottage there. Now, most people know it as Skagen, but my relatives actually said Skane. I think that's the Danish um, pronunciation. And my relative's holiday cottage has, or it includes parts of ships, cabins and doors that have been taken from shipwrecks and built into the cottage in the, in the previous century. It's a really interesting cottage. Now this cottage looks really similar to the Fainu cottages in Crystal's book. So I just want to show you some examples of the photography in here. This is inside a Fainu cottage and you can see that it's all made of wood and it's where people slept and Crystal writes in her book that several people slept together in these small wooden alcoves. They were built short and wide and people often sat upright while they slept. I can't imagine that. It sounds completely horrific, but apparently they did that in the Tudor times yep, as I've well. I've read that. So these beautiful designs, by the way, are her roses and thorns jacket and shawl. The Morning Star Bridal Jacket, which is the project that I'm doing, is based on a traditional Fainu bridal jacket. And Crystal shows the design in two colorways, which are equally beautiful. I've just picked the colors that suit me best. And in her book, she describes how important feasts were on the island and how major festive occasions like weddings, christenings and birthdays took place during the winter when the men were no longer at sea. 
and the feast would go very long and people wouldn't go home until the morning star came out. So that's why the design is called the morning star bridal jacket. But just to let you know as well, Crystal has a great male feral sweater in here called the Prince of Wales sweater, which I just might have to knit for Andrew. Yeah, well, I might put in an order. You have to decide on a colourway. Yep. Which is, they're, they're pretty gorgeous colourways, I have to say. Okay, now, this is what I've done so far. Most of the design is knitted bottom up and, and in the round. But first of all, you start off with the peplum. If you don't know what a peplum is, it's the short section of material that's attached to the waistline of a blouse or a jacket or a dress. So this is my peplum. And it may not look like I've done a lot of work since um, the last episode, but there was quite a fair bit of knitting in this. It started off with 450 stitches, I think. Yeah, I and certainly had the, had the impression you were putting in a lot of effort. Did you? Yeah. There was a bit of swearing, perhaps. Yeah, <laughs> just not that much to show for it. <laughs> I don't knit shawls, so I'm not used to having so many stitches on my needles, I think, yeah. at the same time. Anyway, so you start off with about 450 stitches and then you decrease to about half that amount and it's done in moss stitch, which is one by one, uh, knit one, purl one, knit one, purl one, and then the opposite in the, in the following row. I know it as moss stitch, but I think quite a few people know it as seed stitch, perhaps in America more. Anyway, so it's moss stitch there and it's got all of these lovely little golden bobbles on it. And you might be noticing a bit of scrappy yarn hanging down the bottom. I'll show you the back side, <laughs> the wrong side. And it's looking pretty messy. What Crystal says is not to strand the golden yarn behind in between the bobbles, but I have done that because it's my way of weaving in the ends very efficiently. But I've just pulled it a little bit tight so that it doesn't show through on the front and I'm just going to chop off those little loopy bits at some stage in the future when I need to neaten it up so don't worry about that too much. So what I'm up to now is I have to do three pin tucks and I've just done my very first one and I love doing pin tucks. They're, they're a bit fiddly but they're so neat. It just looks like sewing to me. It looks like I've just sewn in a little edging. Special. It is very neat. And this is where you actually knit it back in. You don't, you don't yeah. sew it. No, no, you knit it back together and then you do another one. So I'll be doing the next one's in the dark colour and then the one after that's in the gold colour. So after I've done those three pin tucks, I then join it in the round and add some sticking stitches and knit the bodice. So it'll be like this, which will be very exciting. I'll have to get married again. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to talk about that though. <laughs> to Fruity Knitting. Today we're going to take a look at the very fresh and innovative knitwear designs of Olga Baraya Kefalian, whose design name is Olga Jazzy. Olga is a knitwear technician with a high sense of fashion. Her mother was a highly trained professional tailor and as a girl, Olga was helping her draft sewing patterns and through this experience she inadvertently learnt a lot about garment construction and fashion. So you could say she had an amazing head start, but knitwear designing wasn't something her family actually encouraged her to do. But it was, however, something she deeply wanted to do and she came back to it after studying some languages. Olga has explored a lot of different techniques in knitting and we're going to touch on a few of them today during this interview. So let's get started. Welcome, Olga. It's really great to have you on Fruity Knitting. Thank you so much, Andrea and Andrew, for having me on Fruity Knitting. It's uh, such an honor to be here today oh, to that's be talking cool. to you about uh, my work. Okay, so before we look at your designs, I'd like to hear a little bit about your background. You grew up in Belarus during the 80s when it was still a fully communist state, and now you're living in America. So you've actually lived in and personally experienced two polar opposite cultures. So how has that impacted you both on a personal level and with your career opportunities? 
It is a really great question because when I grew up in Soviet Belarus, um, behind the steel curtain, we did not grow up with much and my mom being self-employed and uh, sewing for most of her life, we have learned how to upcycle, uh, recycle clothing, so whether it was sewn or upscale. Uh, upscale just ready-made sweaters into something that we needed to have, something to, we needed to wear, accommodate the weather. We didn't have that many tools or that many patterns that we were that at our disposal. And uh, we just had to make do and become very creative. However, once I moved to United States and once I lived in Italy, uh, the discovery of knitwear yarns and different knitwear brands and patterns and magazines com completely turned my world around and I have discovered that this is something I'm very passionate about and I even considered going to school uh, and I have never imagined that the textile world will really rope me in so tightly and to this day will continue fueling up my career but it also very much uh, made me appreciate uh, the items I do create and the items that I have around me. Uh, makes me just more of a grateful human being, I believe, uh, because this is something that not everybody is quite privileged to have. Uh, as for um, personal growth, I have discovered how you can uh, make do but also improve your wardrobe, not just from making and having more of the items, but also expanding your different types and varieties of clothing so you can still have uh, less, but it actually have more of the styles and looks that you can combine, mix and match. And we'll get on to that more in a later question, but I think that does um, influence your designing. And I wanna also say that um, your husband was in the US military and you went with him when he was deployed to Japan. So I'm just wondering also from living in Japan, how has the Japanese culture influenced your designing? Uh, this is going from another polar opposite to even further more. So coming from Belarus then to United States and then moving to Japan is uh, to flip my world upside down in my late 20s where we have discovered the island culture that has a very limited capacity and space for everything. So every little bit of uh, design has populated the areas where there were the architectural buildings, where the tiling or the textile on the seats in the bus. It maybe has to do something with the way my mind works and how impressionable I am because not growing up with much and I wanted to absorb the culture and this is the best way uh, is to live there for four years as we have and uh, for me because it has been so different than there I wanted to document every single little bit of it I have um, sketched I have taken photos of the geometric patterns and I just was really trying to savor every single moment that it really made my mind will go and work and over put it in an overdrive and i think one of the most productive years that i have done when i lived in japan but also to me the culture and the language has been quite fascinating because it i discovered the words uh, onomatopoeia words and being trained as a linguist this japanese language is one of the languages that has the most of them but it also helped me create and name different patterns uh, with an homage and to my admiration for the Japanese culture, but also describe them this way. Uh, right behind me, I have here ten ten, which means small dots. Here I have awa awa, which is uh, soap bubbles. Right behind me are the kune kune, which means meandering and winding. One of the examples of my three-dimensional designs. And right here I have one of the play of words called awa uh, ami ami, which translates as knitted net. There are two different kanjis, but they're pronounced the same. And I feel that this is 
my aspiration and my gratitude towards the Japanese culture because how unique, how different it is. And this is something I aspire to create even more of. Before we move on, uh, you were talking about how you took a lot of, you had a notebook and I suppose you had your phone with you and you were taking lots of pictures of all of the patterning that was all around you. And what's quite interesting about the Japanese culture is that they've got so much, it's so busy sort of outside, but their inside aesthetic is very simple, isn't it? So it's a real opposite. I believe they, you got it correctly because how busy and how overpopulated and how tight spaces are, but the concept of Zen and Buddhism is something that you often find in their homes. That's why their homes quite often are very minimal, very, very minimal decor, because uh, they believe in the culture and the aesthetic where less is more. So when their minds have to rest, they try to avoid the clutter, or at least the concept is to avoid the clutter. So you see those rice screens, you see the very simple floors and very simple living. And I would say Japanese as a culture is a very humble culture. And this is something I can relate without growing up uh, with much. But to me, this is a way for one to rest their mind. So when you have something very minimal, it can be much, much richer uh, in an inner world or things that you see and things that you notice. So even though the surroundings around, about you are quite full, when you come, when you visit a Japanese house, a traditional Japanese house, it's very, very relaxing. Okay, now speak a little bit about your signature range called Transform. What's the concept behind that? And can you just show us a couple of the designs? Transform is a brainchild of mine that I have created when I lived in Japan or started to create. Because around me, I have noticed the upcoming trend of a lot of ready-made clothes that was becoming uh, available for one to purchase, but one that were expanding its uh, looks and varieties of the outfits by just having one item. And I thought, well, one can knit it as well. And I have created the first one, which was called Infinite Loop, but then subsequently I created more and more. And living in Japan, which is a quite a hot country in the summertime, I have uh, designed one of the pieces, which is called Sakasama. The concept itself is to create one item that can be worn in a variety of different styles and ways. And you can whether wear it inside out or uh, upside down, as in the case of Sakasama. Um, just to having one item, but can be worn for an all for four different looks. So this little cardigan is created in viscose yarn, but you can create it with a warmer type of yarn and it creates a very nice and lightweight garment, which is um, quite easy to pack and travel with. And for me personally, it's it went back to the concept of creating a, a garment but thus creating more looks, not having four different sweaters that will show the different looks of it. So as you saw me, first way I shown, I have worn it with lapels up and when I wear it upside down, I have some sort of a shawl color that's very drapey. And according with your yarn choice, you can, uh, they can result in different ways of making them and uh, rendering them different, um, for the needs. Now, several people have two of these. One is for summer and some of uh, for the winter or the colder season, which is in the summertime is even great to toss around your shoulders just for a cooler evening. Um, then I have created a dress uh, which I called Sanagi. And Sanagi dress uh, means more of a cocoon. It's an upside down trapeze which uh, has been created with uh, a variety of different fastenings. So there are snaps, there are, uh, there's eye cord, uh, and there are uh, hook and eyes that were placed strategically that expanded the shape and allowed me to customize it and give it even more options. So we unit one dress, but you actually can wear it to 10 different ways. That's amazing. So 
So you can um, see the video as you can style it, uh, as I style it, and you can create it again in a variety of different yarns where I use 100% linen, which is among my most favorite fibers and yarns to work with because it is still uh, can be warm and it's a really great drape can be shiny and it just lasts really long time and I believe this frugal practical approach of my upbringing shows through there as yeah. well where having several uh, transform garments but that can be worn in variety of different ways and styles and that result in something unique and whatever feeling or emotion you experience in that day whichever you wish to have it styled and um or suit the occasion which is most uh, popular approach i believe so where you can go transition from workwear into something you can have like a cocktail dress you made it in linen can you also put it in pure wool you can but i would suggest maybe creating using it with a wool that is slightly um heavier not in the, not of the thickness of it but the way it spun so it would allow for slightly uh, light drape because otherwise if the wool is woolen spun it kind of will stick because yeah. the trapeze shape it's kind of narrow around the knees and it widens towards the bust and those who use the sections uh, to create the pleats and the folds that actually are becoming easier to manipulate and it's a sleeveless dress so you can always uh, layer it and use it as a um, pinafore type dress. Now while you were in Japan you actually bought yourself a knitting machine so I'm wondering what happened when you started looking again back at your hand knitting through your sort of new fresh machine knitting eyes like did did machine knitting teach you anything that you could apply or, or give you a new innovation with um, hand knitting? Um, machine knitting is absolutely different from hand knitting as I have learned um, because the whole Pre uh, premise of getting an knitting machine was to knit faster or knit items that would be much faster made and worn but I have quickly discovered that I was not able to take any courses because they're all in Japanese so I have to self-teach myself and a lot of the self-discovery through working with a machine knit is quite a bit of work and it's a lot of swatching and then ripping out or swatching and taking off the it off the machine and try it and again then making more swatches and making more swatches ad nauseum until you discover that something that actually works and creates and helps you think or it in my case it helped me tremendously think about knitwear my hand knitting at a different perspective where the angle on knitting something and techniques uh, that I was very much trying to steer clear of in hand knitting I was utilizing more and more in machine knitting and I thought well there's nothing to be scared of or scared uh, utilizing so throughout the process of learning about machine knitting I have discovered things like um, short rows can be done in two different ways short rows as though i derive them they can be done as a full legitimate short rows and hand knitting where we're making them we're trying to conceal the turning points making them as invisible as possible while it, while in machine knitting uh, the short rows application very often is used to create an actual hole and this hole is made and determined a decorative look and this decorative look of holes can be much more satisfying and creating texture. And over the years, I have discovered how I can perfect and make my knitting better and actually create the fabric that's more aesthetically pleasing to my taste. Like in case of this Moko Moko Kao, where I, it consists entirely of short rows, but with holes placed there, um, on purpose to create the relief and break in the fabric that allows for this puffy texture almost uh, like a faux cable to come through but still even here I show you the wrong side it's still very elastic and the color choices that one can do whether do it with a gradient and transition in yarns whether with a type of solid fabrics or fuzzy fabrics 
but it is absolutely different when you are creating this by hand without even thinking what you're trying to make but it's technically only knitting and purling so we do not utilize the uh, techniques like short rows we're used to either of the 10 methods that we learn over the years how to execute them with a shadow short rows you wrap and turn yarn over short rows or uh, well, German Japanese. short rows <laughs> Japanese or German short rows yeah it's amazing how big those holes are. Yeah, some of them are like this. Yeah, they're shaped, huge. But this is a combination of short rows and partial knitting. So when I uh, create a short row without wrapping anything, I refer to it as partial knitting. It's a term I have borrowed from machine knitting because both are short rows, but one is trying to be concealed, like at the bottom here, which is a slip stitch short row. And here it's a partial knit. Wow, I, that it inspires me. I want to knit that just to see how you've done it. <laughs> you will be very much surprised. I often get questions from people who read the pattern and I'm like, what, but what do I do? Sometimes you have to follow pattern verbatim and only then the light bulb moment will come on. And it, when it comes uh, creating hand knit uh, patterns that are inspired by machine knit, they may seem not very intuitive as a, to a hand knitter. So you really have to know both to understand the concept. Otherwise, just follow it word by word and it will come on. Exactly. And I mean, I think that's a good thing to do is just simply not try to understand it before you start, but just understand the ne very next instruction and just do that and then it'll become clearer as you do one little step at a time. I, I totally agree with that. Now, what about... Um, plating in machine knitting so plating is uh this little um, tool actually that allows you to work plating on an any machine that helps you to separate two colors and position them when they're knit one color on one side and the other color on the other side but if you don't put this part into the carriage on the machine it will just blend and marl the yarns so after experimenting and uh, trying to achieve this effect on the machine and trying to translate it into hand knitting, which I found would be very quite impossible because there is no way for us directing how the yarn falls. Plus the machine knitting is also very dense as knit fabric goes. And for us to achieve the same effect, it will be very, very uh, unmalleable fabric. In the case of Awa Awa, I got inspired by still continuing by through hand knitting, experimenting with blending still two of the yarns, but you either wind them before work or just carry them together. But in the sections of the soap bubbles, I utilized the color work section where you just worked the polka dot or the bubble itself in a certain color and the other color is uh, floated behind but in the case of our hour I didn't just float it I also I don't know if it's very visible but I caught the float because they can be very long and the way they're woven in they have created a pattern their own because you alternate the floats and that you can create almost double-sided fabric, some of something reminiscent of, um, I want to say, Armenian knitting. Twisting knitting in a sense, where you're changing it yes. every stitch. Yeah, that's so clever. But the background fabric here is knit with two strands, so it yields a much uh, larger gauge. And when you work in one, you only work with one color, so the stitches are more, more open. That's why I chose to implement the trapping, because otherwise those floats, uh, being a little bit of a perfectionist, uh, they would have caught on buttons or jewelry or other fastenings in your purse. So, but also for me, it's not just you know what the surface looks like. You, as a knit, hand knitwear designer and just a hand knitter, I always want to show off my wrong side and be proud of it. <laughs> Definitely. And that way it doesn't even look like it's got a wrong side, does it? Exactly. Just, and in a way it makes it not look hand knitted. Like surely people would be going, what, what is she doing here? <laughs> so it's not obvious to start off with. That's brilliant. That's really, really great. We're back.
back with Under Construction with my current project, which is the Celine Cardigan by Michelle Wong. In the last episode, I did announce that I'd be finished at least two sleeves by this stage. Andrea was a little bit skeptical, and I do hope you didn't place any bets because <laughs> I haven't quite achieved that result. But I do have one sleeve, which is complete. You're I'll my try assistant. It on. Please do, assistant. So the one sleeve is complete. I've also stitched it in, which I'm really proud of. I chose to use back stitch. I probably could have used mattress stitch as well, but I just picked arbitrarily <laughs> using back stitch, and I think that worked nicely. I've finished all the um, the cabling on the whole body. That's all done and behind me, and I note. It, the cabling is all done on a two by two sort of base. So I've had heaps of practice of two by two rib. Something I noticed when I was doing my, um, my stocking stitch, which is my particular area of expertise, I did have the problem that I rowed out a little bit, which means that my pearl rows were a little bit looser than my knit rows. And you could kind of see that just a little bit. I have found that since doing this great massive two by two rib, that that's not happening anymore. So this stocking stitch is completely smooth and perfect. My, feel, uh, my theory there is that with all this practice of the two by two rib, I've done a lot of switching from the two knit stitches to two purl stitches whilst maintaining a nice even tension. So that seems to have worked well. So that'd be my tip if you want to get rid of your rowing out, you just, you could sort of knit like a two by two rib blanket. <laughs> And after doing that, then you might find that your rowing out has also gone. You might find that your, your um, appetite for knitting is also gone. Could be. Could be. Anyway, this is relaxing and calming for me, so it's nice to get back to my familiar stocking stitch. Yeah. I did do a small modification, and it doesn't really give me much credit, but Madeline said she wanted to be able to fold up the cuff, so I made that a little bit longer. He's milking the situation for value. Yeah, but look, the sleeve is the perfect length. It's the perfect it length on Madeline too, which yes. is a lot of sleeve. Um, <laughs> the other little feature here is at the top where you do the, the cup, the, what do you call it? The, the cap. Cap shaping, yeah. Um, normally, my understanding is that you do the decreases right at the edge of your, your cap. But here, what the design says is to do that sort of three stitches in or three columns of stitches in. So you get a couple of columns of... Um, normal stitches here before you change, get the decreasing angle there. It's quite a cute design feature, and we sort of figure it might be a Brooklyn Tweed signature. Yeah, it's a little bit feature. decorative, isn't it? Yep. But I think it's really, really neat. It's going to be stunning. It's so very neat. Once he's finished the second sleeve, he's just got um, button bands to go on. And what I really like about this design is that it's just a really nice low V neck. Mm -hmm. It's just going to be so cuddly. Yep. The yarn, you didn't mention, it's John Arben Devonia DK, and it's so it's very squishy and cuddly. And, very cuddly. And beautiful. Pe people will be coming up in the street to just give Madeline a cuddle. Our daughter a cuddle. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, it's, yeah, it's totally beautiful. Well done. Shetland Wool Week is starting this coming weekend, and it's actually the 10th anniversary of the festival. We are going, and for the last couple of months, Andrea has been working really hard to organize and plan all of the interviews that we're going to be doing. We've got nine full-length interviews lined up right now, and that does really mean that we're going to be recording an interview pretty much every day. And then around that, we're going to be covering the other activities so that as far as we can, getting as much footage as we can so that we can give you really good coverage of the whole event. And I think we've got some really interesting interviews lined up for you, which is great. And people just come from everywhere to the festival, which means it's a great opportunity for us to interview lots of people in person. And so this is a very convenient and efficient way to work, but it's also lots of hard work and pretty stressful. And it means we don't have time to do anything else like take classes ourselves. But our aim really is to enable you to share in the experience of the festival, particularly for those of you who are unable to get there yourself in person. So in that context, we want to remind you that it is so important for us to grow our patron support. We'll have a lot of expenses to cover for this trip. We've got flights, we've got accommodation, we've got car hire so we can get around with all of our equipment to interview different people and take footage of the festival in different places and things. So please do take the effort to support the production of the show by becoming a patron. You can do so for a small amount each month and it's a very easy thing to, to sign up and do. So thank you.
Hello, my name is Constance, and I bring you greetings from Columbia, South Carolina, here in the United States. I'm here to share my Jane Seymour, a design by Alice Starmore from her publication, To the Roses. Jane Seymour was the third wife of King Henry VIII, and she was the wife's wife who gave him his long for heir, King Edward VI. She didn't have long to share her life with her son because she was soon passed from postnatal complications. However, there are surviving images of Jane Seymour that were even commissioned after her life and in every image, she's arrayed in the most beautiful, luxurious, glamorous Tudor style garments. And the designer, Alice Star Moore, stated in her book that she wanted to create a garment that displayed that glamorous fashion from the Tudor era, a garment that would turn heads no matter what era it was worn in. And I think that she more than achieved that with the Jane Seymour. It is such a beautifully detailed intricate and just luxurious garment that definitely depicts the Tudor era and it was for this reason that I was attracted to the garment. I knew that I wanted to create a design from this beautiful book and all of them were beautiful. However, I placed a limitation on myself in terms of saying focus and decide which garment it is that you are most attracted to, that you find to be the most beautiful out of this entire book, which was a very difficult decision to make. However, I decided that the Jane Seymour was the garment that I found to be the most beautiful thing I'd ever seen in my life, especially with knitwear. So I made it my goal to create this beautiful garment that I knew would be a work of patience, but I felt that the reward would be so great and so amazing and I was more than willing to put in the time. I now wanted to share some of the construction and technical details of this beautiful garment. This garment is seen in pieces. It's created in pieces and then it's seen together. It is a co stranded color work garment. However, it's not your typical stranded color work in terms of that color work is broken up by purling and also by cabling because those beautiful diamonds are created by cabling. I found I learned um, quite a few new things with the creation of this garment and also refined many skills when I created this garment. I found the most difficult thing with creating this garment to be the embroidery because I previously never done that much embroidery at all. And so when I first created the embroidery, I really messed up the back portion and I made a big error with that. However, I did have more than enough yarn to go back and correct that mistake. I also made a mistake when it came to attaching this beautiful collar. I attached it to the wrong side and so I had to go back and unpick the collar and attach it to the right side. There were other techniques that I learned that I found to be surprisingly easy. Uh, when I created this garment. For example, I learned to cable without a cable needle by looking at a tutorial by Very Pink Knits. And it was so simple and I quite enjoyed it. And so that made the creation of this garment really go by much more smoothly. I also learned to pearl continental style because as I've stated, this is a stranded color work project. And I hold the strands of yarn in both hands, which is a method from Alistair Moore's book, Fair Owl Knitting. And so I learned that method, but I didn't really know how to pearl on the continental style. So I did have to refer to a video and I found that to be surprisingly easy also. And I will say that these beautiful rose leaf edgings that are mimicked at the bottom hem on the sleeve cuff and also on the collar creates quite a few ends to weave in. However, the weaving of the ends didn't take that long. I just popped in an audio book and before I knew it, the weaving of the ends went by very quickly. So again, I was pleasantly surprised about how smoothly that went. Uh, with the seaming, I chose to do back stitch to put the pieces all together and I'm so pleased with that choice. I think that it gives it a very nice structure and a beautifully tailored finish and I'm really happy with my choice to go that route. 
Overall, the construction was quite detailed and the finishing definitely took patience and time, but I'm more than happy and I'm happy that I was willing to put in that patience and time because the result was quite nice. When I created this garment, I knew that I wanted to make a matching dress to perfectly complement the design. The pattern I chose was Simplicity 2444. This pattern is out of print. However, it is a go-to pattern for me and I've created multiple versions of this pattern. I thought that the pleated skirt along with the fitted bodice would look really nice with this crop length cardigan or jacket. G'day, my name's Murray Watson. And I'm Harry, Murray's brother, and we're from Millpost, a sheep farm on the New South Wales Southern Tablelands near Bungendore, which is about half an hour east of Canberra, Australia's capital. So uh, Millpost is a family farm. Our parents, Judith and David, came here in the late 70s, and they've been living and farming here ever since. Um, myself and Harry and our brother Roy and his kids are uh, the sixth and seventh generation of our family to live and, and work on in the district. So Millpost's been in our family for nearly 100 years, uh, but that pales to insignificance when you consider the Indigenous people's occupation of this landscape. The Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and their ancestors have been living here for probably tens of thousands of years um, before white people came 200 years ago and took their land without treaty or compensation. Um, and so when Europeans arrived, they brought with them their traditional European agriculture, which is quite poorly suited to our thin, shaly soils. and uh, it's, They're ancient and they're quite fragile, the soils here. Um, and, and also... We've got quite an extreme climate. We've got hot, dry summers and cold, windy, frosty winters and, and quite unreliable rainfall. Case in point, um, we're in our third year of drought at the moment. But when mum and dad met on the inaugural permaculture course, they sort of found a way to see a future in these tough conditions we have at Millpost. And uh, they've been implementing permaculture principles at Millpost um, ever since. So we've got a permaculture whole farm plan and this has allowed our family to have a productive commercial wool growing enterprise, but also to regenerate the degraded natural ecosystems that underpin that um, enterprise. And that's through doing things like planting shelter belts, windbreaks, and also encouraging natural regeneration of our ecosystems. So permaculture also provides us with a framework that allows us some self-reliance. So we meet a lot of our own needs um, in terms of food, energy, infrastructure, by growing our own veggies, um, eggs, milk, meat and timber. And we, we also have a big solar array that supplies us with all our energy. But our main thing is the sheep. We have 1,200 or so super fine merinos with wool averaging about 17 micron. Merinos are the, still the most common breed of sheep in Australia. But because they're such a diverse type of sheep, it's almost better to think of Merino as being a brand um, more than a breed. So the Merino was originally a Spanish sheep, and the Saxon type that we have here was a result of those Spanish sheep being bred with sheep in Saxony uh, to produce a sheep better suited to the colder, wetter climates that we have here in... Wetter. Yeah, in southeastern Australia. Um, our Merinos are a traditional Merrillville type of Saxon Merino bred specifically for wool. And the, the wool is of a very high quality as a result. It's a bright white wool uh, with a fine crimp. And so it traditionally goes to high quality garments like suits. And also because it's so soft, it's great to wear next to the skin. Um, and so it's well suited to sportswear and undergarments and that kind of thing. But we've currently also got a 
couple of rams that aren't that traditional Merrillville type, the SRS rams or soft rolling skin, um, and they're bought based on the Pepin type of merino, which is the most common type of merino if you want to break it down into types. Um, anyway, we're hopeful that some of the characteristics of these Pepin type sheep will help us to reach some of our breeding goals whilst also keeping our beautiful wool. Um, for example, um, because we've phased out mulesing in our flock in the last decade or so, we're aiming to breed animals that have a naturally bare breech to reduce um, fly strike risk. So uh, our livestock calendar begins with the joining of the rams in mid-autumn. Um, we have a five-week or two-cycle joining, and then we shear the, those pregnant ewes just before lambing. We're about to do that now. Yeah, and then uh, lambing and lamb marking uh, follow in the spring, um, and then we shear the rest of the sheep uh, in late spring and early summer. In terms of our animal husbandry, we see a lot of advantages in running the sheep in one large mob as much as possible. Um, it helps to maintain the family structure uh, within the flock, but it also allows um, us to have most of our pasture, most of our paddocks, we have about 50 or 60 paddocks at the moment, um, most of them recovering most of the time. So that yeah, it does mean we have a lot of paddocks, uh, but and it also means we have to have the sheep coming through the yards more than other places might for drafting, for various animal husbandry things like shearing or crutching. Um, so we use stress-free livestock handling techniques um, to make all of this as easy as possible for everyone involved, especially the sheep. Um, so, as we've mentioned, we're currently dealing with a drought and climate change modelling suggests we'll face drier winters and springs moving forward. Um, but we're confident with permaculture and our holistic grazing system that we're adaptable enough to deal with most of the problems, at least, that climate change will throw at us. Um, but we do face other challenges. So, our biggest management issue is actually competition from eastern grey kangaroos. Uh, because Europeans had driven out their main predator from around here, which was the dingo, Australia's native dog. And because there's no real kangaroo harvesting industry anymore, um, kangaroos have really increased in number dramatically in the last 30 or 40 years around us. And that's not only put pressure on us as graziers, but also on native ecosystems. They're being overgrazed. Um, so our long-term average sheep numbers around 3,000 and we're right down to about 1,200 head at the moment. So because, and that's almost exclusively because of kangaroo, competition from kangaroos. And so that obviously has a major impact on our bottom line. Uh, so we've looked at many different strategies to create solutions for this problem. And our current one involves the use of livestock guardian dogs, um, in our case, Maremis. The Maremma sheep dog. So mar maremas are traditionally used to protect sheep from predators such as wild dogs, um, but we're using them essentially as to protect our, our grasslands. So um, the, the dogs roam freely in the paddocks after they've formed a bond with the sheep as puppies. Out in the paddocks, they, they form a deterrent against the kangaroos. They, they kind of replace that top predator. Um, they, they don't actively hunt the kangaroos. They, they might chase them a little bit, um, but mostly just their pres presence instills a little bit of fear in the ruse and, and it means that we can hopefully try to keep them off our pasture. At the moment we're, we're running this as a, a scientific trial to, to see how it goes. So moving on to our yarn which is what we know you're really interested in. Um, our wool traditionally was just sent off to auction uh, as most with most farms in Australia sold through an agent and then it disappears off overseas and we have no idea what happens to it. And that's still actually where most of our wool's going. But we've been thinking for a long time that we'd really like to be more involved in the processing of our wool and do some value adding with it. So seeing what Nan Bray was doing at White Gum Wool inspired us to produce our own knitting yarn. Um, Nan's been super supportive and helped us to have our first run of yarn produced through a mill in Napier in New Zealand called Design Spun. Um, and they now spin and dye our wool for us every season. We've also had lots of support from Bellevue Park, who are a more local super fine merino farm, who have also been producing yarn for a few years longer than us. Yeah, so despite the fact that in general the wool processing, in, processing industry in Australia is more or less dead, um, we've found that there is a small growing community of wool growers and other fanatics who are sort of trying to revive this old industry. 
And when we go and sell our wool at fibre and craft markets, um, we have a really good time actually sharing and our learnings with others and learning from others who are trying to go down the same path as us. So at the moment we have two worsted yarns, uh, an eight ply and a four ply. Um, and we also have these one kilogram cones, which are for dyers and weavers. Um, and then also we've got uh, tops, uh, which are produced 100% in Australia for spinners and felters. So Design Spun, our mill in New Zealand, we think helped us get a really nice balance to the twist of our yarn, which means we get a nice robust and wearable garment from our yarn that still doesn't compromise the beautiful soft feel of the super fine wool. Um, it, it knits up really nicely, very evenly, and we've started to find that some of our customers are actually knitting with it just for the sheer joy of it because it feels so good um, to knit with. And we uh, we call them our recreational users. Yeah, so that, that's been the most rewarding part of this for us, getting to know all of the knitters uh, and dyers and weavers who use our yarn and getting to see them wearing and, and getting joy out of our wool. Um, instead of just watching it disappear on the back of a truck and, and never seeing it again like we used to. And of course, we, we get a real kick out of getting to wear our, our wool ourselves now. That, that's a real joy for us. Um, we, we'd also especially like to make mention of um, a few collaborators who have supported us. So Georgie, who's Tiki Knits, um, and, and she, she writes patterns for us, and like this, this beanie. Murnong um, beanie, Murnong hat. And Hannah from Sunday Woven, she's dyed with our yarn in the past using eucalyptus dyes um, and also is now weaving um, these beautiful baby blankets uh, and also Simone from Gum Blossom Yarns um, who, who gives our wool amazing natural colours with her natural dyeing um, using botanicals and, and Australian natives. So this connection with people and especially our local customers, it ties in really well with permaculture. We're trying to support and reinforce sort of resilient local economies and to a, some degree reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and large-scale industrial agri agribusiness. But it's, it's really, it all comes back to our grasslands and our sheep. Um, we know that the reason we're able to produce really good yarn, really good wool is because we have a, a healthy mob, a healthy flock, and we wouldn't be able to have that yarn if we weren't doing our best to be good custodians of our land. Well, thanks for tuning in. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about our meal post and what we're doing here. See you later. Cheers. People often ask us if we're homesick for Australia and most of the time out of sight is out of mind. But then when you see footage like that of the beautiful Australian bush and particularly those white gums, I just love white gums and the colours that are in their, their bark. Yeah. It's just so beautiful and it really tugs at our hearts and we get pretty homesick and heavy hearted. <laughs> Totally, yes. And um, I have to say that Murray and and Harry are really quintessential Aussie country lads and it was just great to hear their accent again and just the way they talk. It's a really Australian way of talking. Yep. And that, that was great, wasn't it? That yeah. sort of makes us a bit homesick as well. Yeah. But it was also good to see the Australian sheepdog, which is called a Kelpie. Yeah, so the Kelpie was bred... Um, to be to have a lot of energy, but also to be intelligent and to be an independent thinker, because the aim is that they work all day in the Australian outback in the heat, um, but with very little supervision because they've got such large areas to cover. And they actually came, they brought black collies from the UK to Australia and they crossed them with other breeds, but they also included the Australian 
dingo, so the wild dingo, mm. and this has made them very hardy and they are able to keep going right through the day in the heat of Australia, so 40 degrees heat. They yeah, have. they love to work and, yeah. and they've got a ton of energy and and sometimes when there's a ton, of, because they're herding sometimes thousands of sheep yeah. <laughs> at the same time. And when the sheep are together and they want to get to the other side, they jump up and, and run across the sheep's backs and get to the other side. Yeah, quickly. that's what they used to say about Australia. Australia rides on the sheep's back. Yeah. And that was referring to that. Yeah. But wasn't the fleece fantastic? I really loved seeing the quality of the fleece. It was so crimpy and so fine, you know, when you saw that close-up of, of him sorting through the fleece. That was really beautiful. Yep. So I'm definitely going to knit Andrew a jumper out of out of their yarn. And I think the colour that I, I can't remember if it was Harry or I think it was Harry. No, Murray. Murray and Harry. And I think Harry was holding a blue. It was a middle blue and it's just really beautiful. I think you'd look great in it. Yep. So yeah. Good. So <laughs> now Harry and Murray are kindly offering Fruity Knitting Patrons a 20% discount on their yarn and everything in their online store. So this includes their fingering weight and DK weight yarns, cones and combed wool tops for spinning. And there's also a book on how they incorporated permaculture into their farming practices, which looks like a really interesting read. They have free shipping for orders over $100. $100 is about 68 American dollars. And for orders over 50 Australian dollars or say 35 American dollars, the shipping rate will be around $8 American. So I think that's a really good shipping deal. And the full details of all of that, as usual, is on our Patreon site. We've got two quick announcements for our patrons. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been working on a new community space for our Fruity Knitting patrons. Patrons can join in and you'll be able to share your projects and ask questions and share your answers to those questions. Um, also just interact with each other and, and with us. Um, we also, we are aiming for this to be the main way that we communicate with our patrons. And we're also planning, or it gives us a way to give some more behind the scenes updates. So really what we're doing We've got Shetland coming up as an example, and we'll be giving some little updates of what was, what's going on for us during the day. It should be really fun. The platform is up already, actually. We're inviting some patrons to join very gradually. We're doing this very slowly because we really don't have any time to be answering questions or dealing with any problems which might come up. So it is coming. We are, you can expect to receive some sort of an invitation from us over the next month or so, but you may have to be a little bit patient. Yeah. And to kick the forum off, we've uh, decided to start a patron-only knit-along, and that's going to be the Mill Post Merino knit-along. So you can knit any project of your own choice as long as it's knitted with Mill Post Merino yarn. And we're very happy just to give um, Harry and Murray's business a little bit of a boost, if yeah. you can, by, by helping them to do that. So that should be fun. I'm definitely going to be knitting... Andrew a jumper with their beautiful yarn. The, the carl itself will go to at least the end of January, so there's plenty of time to get on the forum and join in on that carl. Now, we have to say goodbye because coming up now is part two of our interview with Olga, which I'm sure you're going to really enjoy. There's lots of um, in-depth topics there on knitting for you to get into. As we've said, we're going to the Shetland Wool Week, so that means our next episode is coming out in three weeks because when we should be recording here, we'll be recording there okay. and recording interviews for you. So be patient, but we'll really look forward to seeing you very soon. Bye. Bye. also do a lot of teaching you do a lot you travel a lot you do lots of classes and workshops and you've got two classes which to me sound very very interesting and that's the modular knitting with negative space and what you mentioned before your 3d knitting class so I think for a few of the viewers and myself included um, it'd be good for you to just first of all explain what those concepts are and then show us how you've used them in different designs as I was learning about machine knitting, I have discovered some techniques that had some strands that were very decorative, but some of them actually prompted me 
to develop different swatches and try to implement different types of uh, methods of weaving in ants and module knitting is something that is created in modules or motifs so equally um, like ami ami is just created in different sections so each strip of this fabric is knit and then attached on so each strip of this is considered to be a module but it's attached subsequently and shifted well, this is a module in itself. When I was machine knitting, I have discovered that I can create negative spaces. And these negative spaces can be created without cutting of the yarn. The sole purpose of me swatching many, many times was to discover how one can create this continuously as many knitters do not enjoy wearing, um, weaving at the ends or milling at the ends and the end of their project and they would rather be knitting but utilize a technique that will allow them to do that. When I have developed this, um, you can see here, technically I have knit the positive space yeah. around these holes. And over the course I have developed a class which is called Modular Knitting with Negative Space where we create different shapes, like in this case, this is, these are triangles, or it almost looks look sus like a suspended chevron, where we knit only and we still work it continuously without breaking of the yarn and the extra thread that we implement we simply work it into the fabric as we're shaping it simultaneously it may come as to sound quite fiddly but it isn't uh, just a little bit of attention span and that will save you quite a bit of work when you're trying to achieve something uh, without having a lot of ants. I say m many of us knitters would rather be knitting and spend our time knitting than sewing for the exception of the very few. Here's I have little bow ties or bonbons. <laughs> These are, this is the fabric that's technically shaped and knit around it. But the negative space that you see it can be depicted in a variety of different, like if you look at it, at the bonbons or the negative space, but the spaces that are knit there, they almost look like diamonds, just look cut off or cut off hexagons. And here's another polka dot, which is just shows a swatch how you can stagger the patterning where you can create these polka dots on top of each other, or you can have them askew, where again, in this case, you do not have to cut your yarn every single time, but because through this series, many, many of swatches on a machine knit and then in hand knit, I was able to develop this and offer this as a new technique for anyone to learn. But also inside the class, I teach uh, my students how to calculate the decrease and increase ratio to achieve a certain shape depending on their gauge. That's incredible. I am so intrigued. I can't imagine how you've done that. <laughs> I'm going to have to get a pattern and have a look at it. That's incredible. So have you got any designs where you've uh, used that that you can show us? Yes, this is the 1010 that I've mentioned previously. It's knit with a British yarn, Daughter of a Shepherd, and it's a hybridian sheep. And uh, 1010 means little dots, little dots. Uh, but it's spelled the same way as number 10 in English. They just have a hyphen between two words. In this design, we uh, work if you can see more positive space around here so this section actually takes much uh, longer to knit versus the very beginning when your positive space is much less but the negative space is much larger and this wrap because of this all this negative space this wrap is very malleable but yet the volume is still is quite warm and in the pattern you can also customize maybe you don't want to transition the sizes of your polka dots maybe you just want to have them work only in one size and the color of your choice it looks so luscious in that deep chocolate doesn't it yeah when I have started creating more and more textured uh, stitch patterns, which are my passion, I love creating stitch patterns, I have discovered that they can be organized in a variety of different ways, utilizing their techniques. But throughout learning um, 
experience of about yarns and fibers and their relation to texture and how the fabrics can behave i found out that uh, different types of uh, fabrics can after washing and blocking with the texture behave differently so i was able you know, for myself as a designer to compartmentalize some of these techniques but also uh the see the concept and how would I um, just tell the world about them. Uh, I divide the fabrics in two different categories. And in the first category, which is uh, I call less controlled fabrics, uh, when we are very much aware of using the yarns that possess memory, we want to have the best um, correlation between the stitches and between the fiber and uh, also how whether this fabric will dissipate after washing and blocking and what steps we have to take in order to try to preserve it that's why they are called less controlled fabrics less controlled fabrics can utilize different techniques most likely to achieve different uh, techniques will be much easier ones. For example, knit and purl, slip stitches, and uh, also uh, lace, which is a, all of these can are uh, renditions of the techniques that I utilize to create three-dimensional knitwear stitches. The second category are called controlled fabrics, where regardless of your fabric choice or fiber choice, or the way the yarn is constructed, you can create uh, your stitches and wash and block them and not be afraid that the texture over years or washing and blocking process will disappear. Okay. And as a remedy, I have, um, I teach in my three-dimensional network classes this uh, about the fiber, about the yarn construction, and why we need to be so much more cognizant about the, our choices when it comes to creation and also um, prolonging the life wear of that knitwear garment. And when you knit something, you spend time learning about it, paying for the pattern. I want an item to last, and that final look once of you bind off, I want it to be at its best. So an example of one of my designs called Boko Boko, it's up and down in Japanese. This is superwash yarn, which is sock yarn. And this one is a small version of the cowl. The cowl comes in three different sizes. But these peaks, they occur naturally because the lace patterning uh, changes directions. And we become a little bit of geologists here where we have two directions pushing on each other, forming a mountain. And when they're pulling it away from each other, they form a valley. But this fabric, creation of this uh, textile, is a lace stitch pattern and is part of the less controlled uh, category. Mm -hmm. Means if I was just to create this with a superwash or plain wool yarn, a larger needle size, over time it would dissipate. But what you don't see here is that I implemented uh, carrying a tiny strand of a silk wrap stainless steel yarn that helped me preserve this fabric, that allows for me to pull it apart and not be afraid to wash and lock it because I can simply reshape this and it would, the shape will be preserved again. And steel, stainless steel, is one of the most hypoallergenic uh, materials that one can work with. And it's silk wrapped, so it does not patina, it doesn't rust, and it does not itch or scratch when you wear it. Is it easy to buy? Like, can you get it easily on online or at a haberdashery store or? Uh, many yarn stores carry it. Uh, personally, I have discovered it uh, through Habu Textiles yarns because they were, the, I believe, the first who started importing it and selling it primarily for weavers, but then for knitters as well. In case of my uh, yarn here, I use Neighborhood Fiber Company, who is a hand dyer out of Baltimore, and she gets the same uh, yarn from Japan. They all, all these companies, they have get it from Japan, but in different percentages, and they just offer in different colors and it looks so effective and just so dramatic it's beautiful and uh, thank you uh, the yarns uh, that are used you know usually you would try to use uh, the fabrics that possess memory the fibers like wool 
to help and preserve it. But if you're not sure, you can always give yourself a little bit of aid by providing it with some of the silk wrap or wool wrap stainless steel yarn and knit it together and not be worried about how the item or garment or their accessory would age. Now, when it comes to the controlled fabrics, I here have um, what is called kune kune and this is a combination of partial knitting modular knitting as well as uh, horizontal pleats or sometimes they're called welts and in this case the fabric is baby yak from baby yak uh, lace weight held double from maya company but this yarn is known to be very soft and when it comes to three-dimensional wear, this is a control fabric so no matter what i do with it uh, with the stitch pattern it will never go away. Similar, like in this other side of the Ginga cowl, I have 50% silk and 50% wool. And this is what I call exaggerated basket weave because this basket weave I've turned and made it into a uh, controlled fabric. Because usually the knit and pearl is one of the categories of the non-controlled fabrics. By implementing more techniques uh, or more like slip stitches and horizontal pleating, I made this otherwise fabric that would be very drapey and uncontrolled, I made it permanent. So this cowl has been washed several of times, but, oh, and this is the wrong side of it. It renders slightly different, but over time, it will not dissipate and the texture is permanent. It is so stunning. You know, I'm actually more of a garment knitter, but I have never been so impressed with um, accessories. Like I'm really itching to, to, to knit something like that. They are so individual. They're really gorgeous. Okay, now there's just one more class that I want you to say something about, and that's your magical brioche class, because I've heard you say that it all started when you were experimenting around with increases and decreases on double brioche, and you just weren't happy with the results. And so what was actually the problem, and what did you develop to, to make it an improvement? To be more precise, uh, I learned to knit brioche from Nancy Marchand's book. And the very first book that uh, she has published, I believe, has also the Stitch Dictionary. And it's a very vast book of knowledge to which it's a very prolific one. And I was very lucky to have met her back in 2008. And I have discovered the double brioche as a stitch pattern, but I was very frustrated as a knitter and being a knitwear designer i want to teach something through by the means by the medium of my pattern so i was looking for the way to improve a fabric and when i found a swatching was very frustrating uh, because it's not very intuitive you have to give all of your attention to the stitches on the needle and i know some knitters when they find um execution being quite a challenge, they give up because it will be too hard. Um, I have collected the knowledge that I've had throughout the years and I combined two different techniques. Again, means of making 10 different swatches and arriving to making double brioche something that is more intuitive and it's easier to read when you see the fabric on your knitting. Okay. And uh, over the time, I have created several patterns using it. So first came non-increase in fabric, but it's completely reversible and it's easier to execute simply because you combine two different techniques, uh, which is brioche and tuck. Okay. The maneuvers are slightly different, but it makes and creates the ease for any knitter, even slightly interme intermediate knitter. You don't have to be advanced knitter to achieve it. Over time, as I very much enjoyed the graphic look of this uh, double uh, brioche fabric, I have also wanted to experiment and make bold things that are accessories, but they would travel differently. This is when it came for my development of decreases and increases. This entire shawl, which is called Sento, means a spire, because it reminded me of a spire in a church when I've seen one yes. in, in yeah. Iceland, but in any other Gothic churches that you see. I have created alternating a type of uh, increase where you would whether execute it on the right side or wrong side. And it created okay, yeah. a very bold, like vertical stripes. But they're not just one by one brioche, they're two by two brioche, which made them more noticeable. 
but also made the fabric grow in a very different manner. When I did my research, I was not able to find any information about double brioche decreases or increases, so I had to sort of invent them. And over time, I have also found how to, to do decreases, which I would say is slightly harder because these type of decreases that I developed in this hat, which I called Oru, which is, means woven, because when there are two colors uh, and they're two uh, by two brioche, the entire fabric is woven, which makes it double thick. But it's just the bold part the, are the lines. With this hat, I made it completely reversible and the decreases that I have developed here are fully fashioned. Fully fashioned means that they are the same or almost identical on the wrong side as they are on the right side. So if somebody has done basic brioche, they can actually just follow your pattern step by step and still get through. Correct. For example, in case of Oro hat, the decreases I've written out quite painstakingly, so they take <laughs> half a page. But so little by little. When I was removed from my knitting community, when I found myself in Japan for four years, I was missing my group of knitters uh, so much, but I still wanted to create my best work. So I missed teaching and I thought that the better patterns quality wise I create, the better techniques I can teach, uh, I still feel uh, like I'm contributing and building uh, to uh, people becoming better knitters and adding more to their uh, skill set. There's just so much there that you've shown us already. I'm quite overwhelmed. There's, I love it. I mean, you've got a fantastic sense of style and fashion that just comes through in every one of your designs. But on top of that, you're a real knitting technician. And I love having knitting technicians on the show because it just really reinforces the idea that the world of hand knitting is endless and there's still so much to explore, which is very exciting. So thank you so much for sharing your knowledge with us. It's been such a treat. Thank you so much, Andrea. I really appreciate sharing uh, with you and I hope your viewers uh, find and discover some of the patterns and get one of them simply so they can learn some of these techniques that I have um, hopefully trying to populate the world using more and more. Well, there's definitely some adventurous knitters in the community, so I think they will take that on. We do need to wrap the interview up, so we've got one last question. It's just a quick, light-hearted kind of question. What was the most unexpected or surprising aspect of your career so far? As I have started on this career, it was uh, more to teach and uh, put my passion and hobby um, of spreading the world where the more patterns and techniques that I have developed and discovered or rediscovered on myself. I have never thought that throughout the years I uh, would garner so much attention and people would ask me to travel kind of far to teach them these techniques. So for me, I often ask myself, is this real life where, for example, next month I'm going to teach at the retreat in Italy and then going to teach at a festival in Denmark where people are all ready to devour these techniques and try their hand at it. Even though, yes, it involves travel, growing up in the Soviet era, you know, behind a steel curtain for a little girl who uh, never thought that she would travel the world at all, this is still quite mind boggling. So I'm very humbled and I'm very grateful for finding this passion, this profession that allows me to meet uh, people of different nationalities, uh, different backgrounds and different education and how they learn about it and also share. And being educated as a teacher, one of the most important part for me is also to learn as well. So that is what I'm mostly um, fascinated to this day about. Well, that is a really beautiful answer. That's a great way to finish. So thank you so much, Olga. Thank you so much for having me, Andrea and Andrew. Okay, so let's say goodbye to the viewers. Bye. Bye.
Thank you. 